Welcome to the Faith and More podcast. This is a trans-denominational podcast. All are welcome and safe, no matter what your faith is or isn't. Hello, my name is Reverend Angel Wise, and I'll be your host. I am an ordained licensed minister, director of the Oblates of Perpetual Light, and life coach. I firmly believe that divine works through people every day to help us. These angels and saints are so very humble, many of us don't know they exist or existed. Each week, we'll explore the lives of these amazing beings. We'll also explore topics that can help your faith, no matter what it is or isn't. The goal of this show is to inspire, encourage, educate, uplift, strengthen, and heal you and your faith. So be sure to follow and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, everyone. How are you all doing? I so hope and pray you all are well and blessed. Thanks so much for coming back. I mean, we had an amazing show, although quite a long show. And yeah, this one's going to be another long one too. But man, if you listened to last week's show, I'm sure you're back because you want more. This Mother Irene's story is just so beyond fantastical. And and that reminds me, I've got to, to, got to insert the disclaimer. Warning, 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 the following, the following could be considered fantastical. So yes, not only fantastical, but also long. Yes, this is going to be another long one, but my goodness. And folks, if you're just now tuning in, or this is your first time to the show, let me thank you and welcome you to the show. It is my deepest hope and sincerest prayer that you find everything you're looking for in a podcast, especially a faith-based podcast here and more. And if you're returning, welcome back. Thanks so much for being a longtime supporter of this show. It is because of you that this show is here. So if you haven't heard the first part of the Mother Irene uh, story or show, go back to last week's show and have a listen before you get to this, because we're we're continuing on from where we left off last week. It, it's mind blowing. I mean, it is, if you're a paranormal enthusiast like I am, oh my goodness, it's just jam packed. And if you're a, a crazy faith person like I am that loves the, the mystics and the mystical and contemplative um, Christianity, then you absolutely love last week's show and this week's show. So let us continue. So Mother Irene says, I asked God in all my prayers to send me that treasure and to arrange for all matters one night while praying tearfully. I saw a luminous, beautiful young man who said, let me get to this real quick. Just to recap real quick, folks, she was um, wanting to be a nun and wanting to not just be a nun, but to start her own monastery, uh, her own Coptic Orthodox monastery, because they didn't have those in her area. And she asked the nuns of the local monastery um, to accept her as an Orthodox. And they were probably Roman Catholic. And they said, absolutely not. So here she is praying for, why not? I mean, with her connections, dial them up. (laughs) Put in your request at the drive-thru and hopefully they'll have it when you get to the window. I mean, I shouldn't have went there with that. I'm I'm just joking. But no. Honestly, if you have that kind of connection with the divine and with spirit and with the saints, yeah, I mean, ask for their intercession, ask for their help. And if you don't, still, I urge you all, ask for their intercession, pray for their help. Ask and it will be given. You just knock and the door will be opened. You just have to keep your ear out for the knock. You have to be open to that. We talked about that a little bit last week. But anyway, so she's praying and this beautiful young man shows up and says, why are you crying? What belongs to you in all this house except those two pictures? Go to my convent. And she replied, who are you? And he answered, I am a martyr and my name is Abu Safian. Literally means holder of the two swords. And then he placed two icons between his arms, between her arms, and then he disappeared. (laughs) So here, St. Philopater Mercurius shows up to Mother Irene 
and says, go, go to my convent. And he says, the only thing you own are these two uh, icon pictures. And he takes them and puts them under arms. He's going to scoot, scoot, get going. <laughs> so, to say the truth, I have never heard or read about a martyr called Abu Safian. Next day, I paid a visit to Father Botrus, the pastor of the Church of the Virgin, and told him about what I have seen and asked him about the martyr. He opened the Synaxium, excuse me, let me slow down, Synaxium, a book that has a compilation of hagiographies of saints and martyrs, along with some church-related events arranged in order of their anniversaries. Okay. And I and let me read the story. He let me read the story of the life and martyrdom of Abu Sifian. On the 25th day of Hator, which is December 4th, it was the first time I read this. Again, this gives more validity to what she's experiencing. You know, those of you who are paranormal enthusiasts and ghost hunters, this gives more validity to what she experienced. She this is someone she didn't even know in a name she had never heard before. Next day, while I was saying my prayers, asking for God's assistance, I asked the martyr to show me how to join his convent. Again, I saw him before me, and he repeated exactly the same words of yesterday. I informed Father Butchers again about this vision. I also told him that I am afraid of conceit due to many visions. I have seen, he answered, be patient. He will do something. So, yeah, definitely. You've got... Try to put, yeah, definitely, definitely can't do that. Try to put yourself in Mother Irene's sandals. There, for a, someone that was born, literally born and raised in such an environment that has such experiences is literally beyond our imagination, our wildest dreams. I mean, let alone one experience would literally blow our minds and our heart. Yeah. As I said about back in the St. Margaret episode, when St. Margaret reached her hand out of the coffin and touched the poor girl next to her that suffered from a very similar, if you guys haven't heard the St. Margaret episode, go back. That is definitely awesome. Not as long, but it's really awesome. Touched the little girl and healed her. And as I said in that show, if St. Margaret would reach over and heal me, of my heart and diabetes ailments, <laughs> I would die of a heart attack, number one. And number two, she'd have to bring me back from the dead or take me to heaven, one way, one or the other. Because again, how would we react? Think about that as we're going through this, folks. And again, I greatly urge you to go to the show notes and go to this PDF, download it to your phone, your tablet, your computer, print it out, study it, look it over, pray on it. Just take one of these passages of one of these incidents where, um, you know, Mother Irene has this encounter and pray on that saint and see if you can have a similar encounter. If you feel you do, let me know. I would love to hear about it. I, no, I wouldn't have to share it with everybody and I wouldn't. I would respect your privacy. If, but if you wanted me to share it with others, I'd be more than happy to. Just let me know. My contact information at the end of the show and at the end of every show. But what I'm saying is, being long-winded again, um, we can have these experiences. Again, you know, if you just listen and you just be quiet and, and listen and feel with your heart, not your head. Again, we got to go from our head to our heart. So let me read that last sentence again, because what follows next has a lot to do. So I informed Father Boutrous again about this vision. I also told him that I am afraid of conceit due to the manner of the visions I have seen. He answered, be patient. He will do something. In spiritual life, they call this a right strike in the sense that many consecutive heavenly visions might lead to self-conceit. You might get a big head, no doubt, and become a televangelist and have a mega church. Nothing against any of them or those who follow those. Uh, but you might you know, start wanting to go out and perform miracles and make tons of money. So, Thus, pave the way of the devil to arrange for a quick fall in your spiritual life and stray away from God. A left strike is the opposite. It is a series of consecutive falls in spiritual life that might lead 
to desperation in relationship with God and thus cause us to stray away too. Both lead to the same thing, but in different ways. The devil uses anything, or say darkness, whether good or bad, to achieve his means. This is really interesting, and I, I, I really appreciate them putting in this because I'd never heard of this. I'm, you know, I love Coptic Orthodox and love Orthodoxy, but I'm very um, green in my um, knowledge of them, um, especially Coptic Orthodox. I, I know very little other than what I've learned through Father Lazarus L. Anthony and, and what we're learning through this amazing, amazing uh, um, article. But it's saying that there's, I've never heard of the right and left strike. So right means things are going so well in your life that you start being conceited and you forget about the divine. You forget about Adonai. You forget about your faith. You forget about your study. You forget about your practice. You forget about prayer. You get so caught up and things are going good, right? But at the same time, what happens when things go bad? Then you turn, or I shouldn't say you, then most people turn to their faith and say, why me? Why now? Um, and, and pray and pray and pray. And then they want to study and then they want to practice. And then they wonder, why isn't things getting better? Why aren't things getting better? And they see that pulls you away from your faith as well. You know, as my wife always says, you've got to have that middle path. You've got to be right down the middle. You can't be right strike or left strike. You've got to be in the middle. Always be consistent with your study and practice. And that brings me to the Oblates of Perpetual Light, which I'm going to insert a very small advertisement or advertisement, however you wish to call it, here in just a second. But through the Oblates of Perpetual Light, it can help you with your studies and your practices and your prayer in your daily life. The only requirements to be an Oblate is to pray once a day, anytime you want, whatever prayer you want, you can even make it up. Second is to study and contemplate something every day, whether that be a Bible, a Quran, Torah, um, what have you, what, uh, you know, the Dhammapada, Whatever your faith is, whatever sacred text or self-help text uh, or gurus that you follow or teachers that you follow, their books, study and practice or study, excuse me, study and contemplate something from them every day. And it can be even just one sentence or one word. Those of you who are from the Eastern faith, then one word can just zap your mind. Really, it can, it can clean you out. From... <laughs> There's an image for you all. It can clean you out from one end to the other. And I'm not over-exaggerating that. That is the honest to Adonai's truth. Uh, so, again, let me insert this commercial real quick or advertisement real quick about the Oblates Perpetual Light. And if you would like to become an Oblate Perpetual Light, information is on that episode or, excuse me, on the advertisement. Sorry to interrupt the show, folks, but I do have a question for you really quick. Are you looking for something to help you with your faith? Are you searching for your faith? I have just the thing for you. It's called the Oblates of Perpetual Light. This is a group I have just created uh, that I am the director of, that its goal is to help others strengthen and deepen their faith no matter what it is or isn't, and also to help those who are interested in discovering their faith, something that fits them. And it's also a community of people that love and respect everyone, regardless of what their faith is or isn't, what their gender is or isn't, what their marital status is or isn't. There are just four things that go for the Oblates of Perpetual Light that are required. And if you go to the website, you can find those out. It's very easy and it's probably stuff you're already doing already. So for more information on becoming an Oblate, and I have to say one thing real quick is the Oblates of Perpetual Light is a safe place. You are completely safe with the Oblates. No harm will come to you, only love, support, and respect. So the website for the Oblates, please check that out first, is Oblates PL. O B L A T E S P L dot Wix site dot com forward slash oblates dash P L. Or you can contact me at oblates dot P L at gmail dot com. And I'll have links 
to both of these in the show notes and descriptions. I hope to see you as an oblate very soon. Now joined your regularly scheduled programming already in progress. What Father Boutros expected happened on the third night. I saw the martyr in an officer's uniform and he said, I want you in my convent in Cairo. Astonished, I replied, a convent in Cairo? He answered, I will take you with me to see the convent. A few of the nuns will be receiving some of the relatives and one or two will see you and ask you whose relative you are. Do not give an answer, just smile. I asked the martyr to make the sign of the cross. He made the sign of the cross and said, let's go, don't be afraid. When we see visions, we always ask whom we see to make the sign of the cross first, to be sure that the vision is from God's side and not a false apparition of the devil, darkness, pretending to be a saint or angel. We also make the sign of the cross ourselves as the devil or that which is dark cannot stand the sign of the cross. That is very, very powerful and interesting all in the same time. I had not heard of this in all of my studies and all of my years, but it makes absolutely perfect sense. Now, there are some who, and this is a very good question, one of which I don't quite have an answer to. Now, um, those of different faiths have posed the question, what if the spirit or that which is dark was never Christian at any time, um, how would they respond or would they even respond at all to the sign of the cross? Would it even do anything to them? I firmly believe that that comes down to you. That comes down to your strength and your faith. Because if the sign of the cross means protection, um, truth, salvation, forgiveness, rebuke, rebuking, rebuction, what's that? Rebuking, then it will have that effect, I believe, on, well, I guess I do have an answer, uh, will do, will have an effect on that which is trying to oppress or inflict or possess you. Um, so this makes really good sense to, you know, when you have a vision or you're seeing something like this, that you ask them to do the sign of the cross, and you do it as well. Um, those of you who are Christian, those of you who are of other faiths, I would recommend doing whatever your faith um, delegates as ways of protection. Uh, definitely do that. And again, that way you know for sure whether the being or entity or energy is of the light or the dark. Then I found myself on horseback, and in a few seconds, we were on the second floor of the convent. There I met two nuns who asked me, Beauty, whose relative are you? And as directed by the martyr, I remained silent and smiled. The martyr was present, but the nuns could not see him. Then he said, Have you seen my convent? I answered, Yes, but how do I come here? He said, my God will arrange for it. After this, I saw the railroad and the nearby Hermel Hospital, and he quickly dropped me home at Gerga. By God's providence, Omina Maria, a nun from the convent of Abu Sifin in Cairo, came for a visit to Gerga. What are the odds of that, huh? To see her sister who lived in a small village called El Sheikh Alam, on the east bank of the Nile, where you know Gerga in Gerga, where we used to live, lied on the west bank, and it goes on to say Omina literally means mother in Arabic, or Tamav literally mother in Coptic. Precede the names of nuns. Tradition has it that only the mother superior's name is preceded by Tamav, and all of the rest of the nuns by Omina, just for the sake of distinction. Omina Maria's visit was during the fast of Jonah, and she used to attend Mass in Gerga in the nearby Archangel's Church. 
A friend of mine got to know her and told me that she has met a nun from the convent of Abu Sifin in Cairo, and I asked her to put me in contact with her. So we met, and I invited her to spend the three days of the fast of Jonah's or Jonah at our place. We spent a lot of time together in my room, and I told her that I would like to become a nun, and I asked her to pray for me. On the last day of the Feast of Jonah, my father met Omina Maria, and he spoke with her for a while. She told him about how things run in the convent. What he heard from her made him more worried and very sad, too. Now he was more determined than ever not to allow me to join the convent. Later, Omina Maria had to go to the hospital to undergo an operation, and I visited her several times. She promised me to ask Tamav Kiria Wasif, the mother superior, to correspond with me, and I gave her the address of one of my friends. And it gives some more information on who Tamav Kiria Wasif was. Uh, she was born in Tahata, a town in the province of Suhog. She joined the convent in 1903 and was consecrated as a nun in the same year by Father Bolus El Baramasi and later was ordained as Mother Superior in 1928. She departed the past and went to repose on September 24th of 1962. Tamav Irene succeeded her as Mother Superior. Very interesting. I love how this article, this story is giving us so much background information and connecting so many dots. Back at the convent, Amin, Omina, excuse me, Maria spoke with the mother superior and received letters from her at the address agreed upon by one day. By mistake, the letter arrived at our address and my father received it. It said, take the train and get off at Giza station, a railway station in Cairo, and you will find me waiting for you. When my father read this, he smiled and looked at me and said, is it right to do this? Is it right to break the heart of your parents? What will people say about us? Let us be patient and let us pray and fast to find out God's will. I will allow you to join the convent and I will drop you there by myself. You must go in a decent way and not by running away. When my parents saw that I was determined to become a nun, they resorted to fasting and prayer and dedicated a period of 15 days preceding the fast of the nativity for this intention. Daily masses were held in the afternoon. They usually ended at 3 p.m. My mother was unable to attend the last mass, so on that day she prayed in her room asking for God's guidance to reveal what is best for my future. While praying, she saw the following vision. A bright light lit the whole room and she saw angels laying something like a foundation. She asked them, what are you doing? They answered, we are building a foundation for the queen, the mother of the king, who will be here soon. Finally, they placed a fascinating chair adorned with gold and jewels on the foundation, and amid a host of angels, the Virgin Mary arrived and sat on it. With profound reverence, my mother kneeled before her and said, Peace be upon you, O mother of light. Then the virgin said, Have you forgotten what I told you about your eldest daughter when you were in labor? She is ours, and I have engaged her to, to my son. Do not be afraid. Let her join the convent, and she will be under God's protection, or else we will take her back right now. My mother replied, Let it be as you say. I will convince her father. So this is something um, maybe a lot of you will not know uh, with regard to the Catholic faith, that when um, someone becomes a nun, they are consecrated to Jesus. They are married to Jesus. So in effect, Jesus becomes their husband. And I know to a lot of people that might sound very strange, uh, very bizarre and, and um I don't know, just hard for you to wrap your mind around. But it's it's a very long and rich tradition uh, within convents. Um, that's why you will see um, nuns with like a wedding band, like it's just a plain wedding band on. Um, and that just means that they are, you know, they're married to Jesus.
As soon as my father returned home after church, my mother informed him about the vision she had seen. But my father said, let's build for her a cell on the roof. She must not go to the convent. The prevailing idea at that time was that those who join the convent are either handicapped or blind or etc. My confessor, who was a saint, visited us at the time and was able to convince my father that becoming a nun at home was a futile idea. With his wisdom, he told my father, let her join the convent. In a week's time, she will come back with her own free will. Your daughter is spoilt, and when she starts to suffer from the hardships of the life at the convent, she will call you and ask you to bring her back. My father agreed, as he knew that at that time, life in a convent was very rough. I like that. Very good tactic by her spiritual director and confessor to say what he said and how he said it to her father. You know, you know, being her spiritual confessor and director, he knew her better and knew her spiritual ways better than anyone, you know, in human form. So he knew that if she was able to get permission from her parents, she would do just fine there. She would flourish. But he said what he said and how he said it to persuade her father to to give in. You know, he was he was a very good psychologist. <laughs> Fazia's fervent prayers never ceased. She asked for help of the saints and devoured the books of their lives and words. She sought their assistance and with their help, she was able to join the convent. For example, she told us what had happened between her and St. John Christosom. And Christosom is means the golden mouth. <laughs> but St. John Christosom among Orthodox and Byzantines and uh, Coptics is a very, very, very well-known saint. One night while I was reading a book about the life of St. John Christosom, on the day of his commemoration, I saw that there were some unclear matters. I saw him in a vision. He was holding a cross in one hand and a golden Bible in the other. He introduced himself to me and I asked his, for his intercession to facilitate my way to monastic life. In another vision, he said, it is all over now. I have been with your father and mother and matters have calmed down. I went immediately to my parents' room who met me with a smile and said, it is finished. We have agreed to let you join the convent. I said, I know who persuaded you. And they confirmed that they also saw St. John Chrysostom. So now the article gives some background on St. John Chrysostom. So St. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, was born at Antioch in and about the year 347. And to the family of a military commander, his father, Secundus, died soon after the birth of his son. His mother, Anthusa, widowed at 20 years of age, did not seek to remarry, but rather devoted all her efforts to raising of her son in Christian piety. The youth studied under the finest philosophers and rhetoricians, but scorning the vain discipline of pagan knowledge, the future hierarch turned himself to the profound study of Holy Scripture and prayerful contemplation. Saint Miletesus, Bishop of Antioch, loved John like a son, guided him in faith, and in the year 367, baptized him. Saint, when Saint Miletius had been sent into exile by the Emperor Valens in the year 372, John and Theodore, after Bishop of Moposistia, studied under the experienced instructors of ascetic life. The presbyters Flavian and Diodorus of Tarsus. When John's mother died, he embraced monasticism, which he called the true philosophy. Soon John and his friend Basil, also known as St. Basil, were being considered as candidates for the Episcopal office, and they decided to withdraw into the wilderness to avoid this. Well, St. John avoided the Episcopal rank out of humility. He secretly assisted in Basil's or Basil's consecration. The saint spent four years struggling in the wilderness, living the ascetic life under the guidance of an experienced spiritual guide. For two years, the saint lived in a cave in complete silence, but was obliged to return to Antioch to recover his health. St. Miletius, the bishop of Antioch, ordained him deacon 
in 381. In the year 386, St. John was ordained presbyter by Bishop Flavian of Antioch. St. John was a splendid preacher and his inspired words earned him the name Golden Mouth, Christism. For 12 years, the saint preached in church, usually twice a week, but sometimes daily, deeply stirring the hearts of his listeners. Maybe I should pray to him for <laughs> intercession to help me with my homilies, huh? How about that? What do you think, folks? The fame of the holy preacher grew, and in the year 397, with the death of Archbishop Nectarios of Constantinople, successor to St. Gregory, the theologian St. John Chrysostom was summoned from Antioch and elected to the see of Constantinople. At the capital, the holy arch pastor was not able to preach as often as he had in Antioch. Many matters awaited the saint's attention, and he began with the most important, the spiritual perfection of the priesthood. He himself was the best example of this. The financial means apportioned for the archbishop were channeled by the saint into the upkeep of several hospices for the sick and two hostels for pilgrims. He fasted strictly and ate very little food and usually refused invitations to dine because of his delicate stomach. So if you didn't quite catch that, folks, he forewent his uh, pension or salary uh, for being an archbishop and, and moved that money, had that money go to um, several hospices uh, for the sick and two hostels for pilgrims. The saint's zeal in spreading the Christian faith extended not only in the inhabitants of Constantinople, but also to Thrace, to include Slavs and Goths, and to Asia Minor and the Pontine region. He established a bishop for Bosphorus Church in Crimea. St. John sent off zealous missionaries to Phoenicia and to Persia and to Scythianus or Scythians, yeah, <laughs> to convert pagans. Sorry again, folks, to Christ. He also wrote letters to Syria to bring back the Marcionites into the church, and he accomplished this. Preserving the unity of the church, the saint would not permit a powerful Gothic military commander who wanted the emperor to reward his bravery in battle to open an Aryan church at Constantinople. The saintly hierarch denounced the desolate morals of people in the capital, especially at the imperial court, a respectable of person. When the empress Eudoxia connived to confiscate the last properties of the widow and children of a disgraced dignitary, the saint rose to their defense. The arrogant empress would not relent and nursed a grudge against the arch pastor. Doxia's hatred of the saint blazed forth anew when the malefactors told her that the saint apparently had her in mind during his sermon on a vain woman. Court was convened composed of hierarchs who had been justly condemned by Christosom, Theophilus of Alexandria, Bishop Severing of Gabala, who had been banished from the capital because of improprieties and others. This court of judgment declared St. John deposed. They pretty much fired him and put him in exile. And, oh, excuse me, wait. And that he be executed for his insult to the empress. Wow. The emperor decided on exile instead of execution. Okay, so I was kind of right. An angry crowd gathered at the church, resolved to defend their pastor. In order to avoid a riot, St. John submitted to the authorities. That very night, there was an earthquake at Constantinople. The terrified Edoxia urgently requested the emperor to bring the saint back and promptly sent a letter to the banished pastor beseeching him to return. Once more in the capital church, the saint praised the Lord in a short talk. For all his ways, that was the name of the talk. The slanderers fled to Alexandria, but after only two months, a new denunciation provoked the wrath of Exudia in March 404 on, excuse me, an unjust just council was convened, decreeing the exile of St. John. Upon his removal from the capital, a fire reduced the church of Hagia Sophia and also the Senate building to ashes. Devastating barbarian incursions soon followed and Exudia died in October 404. 
Even pagans regarded these events as God's punishment for the unjust judgment against the saints. I like the end there with the pagans agreeing with the saints. You know, that interfaith. It's just a shame that could not be reciprocated that, you know, Christensen and, you know, the Catholics could not have seen that in the pagans, you know, but bless the pagans for, you know, rallying behind him and, and supporting him in their own way. As the crypt of St. Basilicus, or excuse me, at the crypt of St. Basilicus, St. John was comforted by a vision of the martyr who said, despair not, brother John, tomorrow we shall be together after receiving the holy mysteries. Hark fell asleep in the Lord on September 14th, 407. His last words were glory to God for all things. The holy relics of St. John Chrysostom were solemnly transferred to Constantinople in the year 438. The disciple of St. John, the venerable Isidore of Pelusium, wrote, The house of David is grown strong and the house of Saul enfeebled. He is victor over the storms of life and has entered into heavenly repose. So back to the story. By God's providence, Omina Maria came to Gerga and visited us at that time. We agreed that I go with her to the convent. But on the night before we traveled, my paternal uncle, Taufik, heard about it and was so furious. He hastily came to our house and addressed my father, saying, how can you leave your daughter to do this? No, she must not go to the convent. I will not let her go. I will sit by the door and prevent her from leaving. And he actually did, as he said. But when we were leaving, he was wondrously asleep and we left peacefully. My father joined us later at the railway station and bought for us the tickets. When my uncle woke up, <laughs> He headed quickly to the station, but our train had already left. Thus, the Bride of Christ began her first steps towards angelic life on April 16th, 1953, which is 8 Bermuda, 1669, according to the Coptic calendar of martyrs. She thanked and praised God who helped her achieve her heart's desire. And as soon as she took the first step to climb up the heavenly ladder, her fervent love for God was so clear and through good strife and vigilance, she progressed in virtues and managed to soar up to high levels of perfection. But will the devil stand still before the ardent heart that is full of true love in its flight towards heaven? How will a girl at such a tender age be able to pursue her monastic life among the nuns and fulfill her desire for the serving of others? How she prayed praised and worshiped God in her private life? How was she closely related to saints, especially St. Philopater, Mercurius, in whose convent she was a nun? What about her ardent desire to win a martyr's crown in heaven? She, how she pursued every kind of ascetic practice and mastered self-discipline? How she kept the vigilant eye of her soul alert? How she bore the burdens of others? How countless miracles were performed proving her sanctity. What about the innumerable visions she saw, how she was, has become a living example of holy saints, how she strived for progress and constantly inter intensified her course of monastic life, how people flocked in crowds to her, recount endless miracles that had been performed, how she stirred the hearts of thousands in Egypt and abroad, how humble she was despite the halo of renown which hung around her. What about the countless miracles that are performed nowadays through her intercession from her heavenly abode? This is what is coming next. And if I could interject here uh, just to share for a moment, and I'll make this brief, folks, I'm sorry. And I don't mean to make it about me, but this this really moves me. Her, her conviction um, to become a nun and I can completely relate to her uh, because I have a similar conviction to become a priest. Um, I'm a licensed minister now, so that's awesome and that's great. And I am so beyond blessed. Um, but I still, in my heart, I know 
that the divine wants me to receive holy orders. Um, in the independent Catholic Church or some form of the independent Catholic Church where I can be you know, inclusive and, and help everyone. Um, again, that's extremely vital to me that I'm, I'm able to do that, able to just continue to do this show as we do it, um, to be here with you all in, in, in all shapes, sizes, and forms that we possibly can together. Um, and I, 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 can, I have all kinds of testimony that I could share, but I won't on how I know the divine is making this happen. It's, it's coming into being. It's coming into fruition at the pace of the divine. And that's is exactly what we see through um, Mother Irene is, you know, she wanted to be a nun yesterday, uh, but she had to go through a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of work to make it happen. And this is something we can all learn from her. I mean, I'm not saying those who want to become nuns or, or, or priests or clergy or monastics or anything like that. In your daily life, what is that key that we see running through Mother Irene from beginning to end? It's her faith. You've got to have faith. If you have that faith, stop thinking of the George Michael song, God have faith. Come on, guys. Focus. <laughs> I know maybe two people raised their hand that went through their mind. Uh, but anyway, it's the faith that gets you through, no matter what's going on in your life. Every moment is a new moment and a moment you'll never have again. And every moment is impermanent, means it's not going to last. So the good times, they're gonna come and go. The bad times are going to come and go. But that which is eternal is the divine in you. That faith that you have, Keep your faith. Stay strong in your faith. Can't say it enough. Pray, study, contemplate, practice. You know, take it from your head to your heart to your hands. Finally, Fazia, accompanied by Omina Maria, arrived in Cairo on the 16th of April, 1953. They headed first to the Coptic Orthodox Patriarchate of St. Mark, where Fazia expressed her wishes to join the convent of St. Philopater Mercurius, in old Cairo. They wondered why she would, has chosen to join that poor and unorganized convent. Why not join the convent of the Virgin at Ziwila, a very old suburb of Cairo? But Fazia was resolved to join the convent of St. Philip Pater in answer to the call of heaven to fulfill the martyr's request. She loved the life of purity and chastity in her contemplation contemplation, excuse me, was on the most high. She followed the example of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the spiritual mother of all virgins, who was her intercessor and heavenly mother too, and who always assisted, consoled, and comforted her whenever she suffered from any troubles or pain. Heaven has become her beloved abode in which she dwelt while she was still struggling on earth. At home, before she joined the convent, Fazia soared up high, in her spiritual life, through her close relationship with the Savior, and through fervent prayers and ascetic fasts. Deeply rooted in the fountain of the water of life, the tender budding plants sprouted quickly at the convent and pursued a deep spiritual life that very few could pursue after long struggles. She managed, by God's help, to earnestly take her first steps towards the royal path, God strengthened and supported her to face the snares of the devil who waged a war against her from the first moment she set foot in the convent. Yet in everything, she managed to conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved her. Mother Irene tells us about her spiritual experiences with the various wars waged by the devil. And I'll just say darkness because again, as I recently did a show on that, I, be, I believe that term has been used just so much that people are numb to it and it doesn't phase them, but darkness does. To demonstrate the power of prayer and how weak the darkness is and how he vanishes just by making the sign of life giving cross. She also shows us how to conquer him and to watch out for his snares by asking for God's help because 
Our Savior never abandons us. When I joined the convent, I had no cell for some time, and on the first three days, I had no food or water. I did not care to ask for anything, as we were in the Holy Week, and I told myself, let me fast harder. But Omina Tawakila, or Tawaklia, excuse me, one of the older nuns who loved to perform acts of mercy, had pity on me. She took me to her cell and offered me food and a hot drink, as I felt very cold. Later, Omina Martha received me in her cell. And folks, if you don't know um, what a cell is, it's not a prison cell, though it's, you know, similar in meaning. Uh, it's just the room. It's a very small room, usually like a six by six room, um, maybe just a little bigger uh, that the nuns and also monks and priests and stuff uh, stayed in back in those times. At that time, my father kept sending me messages asking me to go back, promising to arrange for a a cell at home, but I always refused. After some time, I was given an abandoned cell in the second floor. It was not suitable for living. I cleaned it and I was supplied with a couch to use as a bed. In the evening, it was very dark and I had no candles or kerosene lamps to light the cell. I spent a lot of time praying and thank God that I have a cell. When I finished my prayers, I slept on the couch and as I had no cover, I used the coat I traveled with. To say the truth, I was very happy. And I can completely get that and understand that, is that she was just so happy, literally elated and in bliss that she had made it to the convent and was going to fulfill her dream of becoming a nun. So it didn't matter. The living conditions didn't matter. The food or lack thereof didn't matter. Um, the thing was, she was there and it was going to happen. Hardly had the first hours of night pass when I suddenly found before me a black, tall creature. His feet were on the ground and his head reached up to the ceiling. He had horns and his eyes were as red as blood. He was holding a knife in his hand and he threatened me saying, so, you have come and moreover you have a cell. I will not leave you. I have all the time. And he struck the floor with the knife. From the horror of the sight, I leapt on the couch and screamed, O power of God, save me. O power of God, protect me. And I fell on the floor, frightened to death. Omina Tawaklia, who occupied the next door cell, heard my screams and the thud when my body hit the floor. She knocked on my door, but I was unable to move. She used a knife to open it to find me lying on the floor with an ice cold body. She took me between her arms until I felt warm again and took me to the mother superior, Tamav Kiria Wasif, who prayed for me and rubbed my forehead with holy oil, deeply scared. I asked her to permit me to stay with her in her cell. She answered, no, do not be afraid. The darkness is like straw. Just make the sign of the cross and it will vanish. It is trying to scare you. Go back to your cell. Do not be afraid. I returned to my cell but could not sleep. I stayed awake all night holding the cross in my hand. And just reading that over brings back what I just said a few minutes ago is what if the darkness isn't of your faith? I mean, here is a convent that should be a very, very sacred place that you wouldn't think anything dark would ever get near. But as we also saw with St. Padre Pio, for those of you who didn't, haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that show. Uh, that was a couple of seasons ago. But with St. Padre Pio, he had battles with darkness actually in his room almost nightly. So it goes to show that it comes down to the one thing. And again, that's your faith and your strength in your faith to see the darkness for what it actually is. And again, we have to remember that the darkness is not as strong as we are. Humans have this divine right and this divine blessing um, that the darkness and even angels don't have. Thus, they say that's one of the reasons for the fall of the angels because they were jealous. Uh, but there's more to that than that, or more to the story than that, which we'll get into at a, at a later show. 
But again, I just thought this was very curious because it, it actually pointed out that, you know, here she's telling this, you know, thing to go and she's doing what she's supposed to be doing, but yet it's still scaring the tar out of her and doing what it's doing. So it'll be interesting to see how things unfold from there. So Mother Irene continues, also, sometimes when I prayed and prostrated myself, I saw snakes and scorpions on the ground. The first time I told myself, my cell is clean. Where did they come from? I was scared and left the cell at once. And I'm sure she was, because remember, folks, she got bit by a scorpion when she was a baby, when she was very young and, and literally died, but was brought back. She said, I was so scared and left the cell at once. Help me. I have a snake in my cell, I told a nun passing by. At once, she understood what this meant and said, if you see snakes and scorpions, do not be afraid. This is the darkness. Just make the sign of the cross and all will vanish. Next day, I saw a big snake and when I prostrated myself, my forehead touched it. This happened many times. And the confessor of the convent, Father Makar L. Macri, com comforted it and encouraged me saying, touch them with your head. And I kept assuring him that they were real. He reassured me again, do not be afraid. Put your head on them. So that's the thing she had to learn is that these things of the darkness are not real, that they are illusion. They're like a magician's trick. They do these things um, to, to make us do things. Because as I've talked about in previous shows, and I firmly believe this, the darkness can't make you do anything. It can't physically make you do anything. Now, if you're possessed, that's a different story because it's gotten in so far into you, so far ingrained in you that you are doing the negative things. You are becoming the darkness, not necessarily darkness is controlling you. It's just that you've let it in so much that it's so consumed you that you become it, so to speak, if that makes sense. So by her realizing that these are mere illusions, you know, they can't physically do anything to her, but by her staying again, strong in her faith and steadfast in her faith, doing the sign of the cross, something very simple, but again, coming from a pure heart and strength of faith is extremely powerful. In order not to break my monastic spiritual rules, I obeyed him. And it goes on to say, each nun has a spiritual rule to follow. These rules are given by a spiritual elder. The rules organize the spiritual books to read, life in the cell, individual prayers, especially at night, the number of psalms to read, the number of prostrations per day, work, the quantity of food to be eaten, etc. And folks, these are just disciplines. These are like what we talked about recently with St. Benedict, like the Benedictine rule or the rule of St. Benedict or the monastic rule. It's, it's very, it's, it's exactly that. It's, it's to help foster, encourage, support, strengthen um, their faith. You know, to have discipline is extremely important. And I've talked about that on infinite shows and probably <laughs> infinitely will continue to talk about that because I can't ever stress the importance of, of that. Um, and it's not, it's not that you have to be, it's not like a military discipline. Although if you can do that, that's great, but most of us can't. It's just some kind of discipline, meaning that you make a commitment. Again, here we go with the oblates of perpetual light, that you're just making some kind of commitment to do something every day. One prayer, reading of one line or a word or a, you know, a paragraph of a sacred text or something um, of your faith that will help you, maybe from a teacher or, or someone that you... Um, want to learn from and contemplating that, you know, putting that into practice. That's, that's it. But it takes discipline because our lives, again, are pretty much on autopilot. And again, we've got to switch that off. So we continue with poor mother Irene. My forehead really touched their bodies. And when I prostrated myself, carrying a cross in my hand, they disappeared because prayer is the powerful weapon that scares the darkness and with patience and perseverance, we defeat them. On another occasion, on a pitch dark night, while carrying a kerosene lamp, 
as there was no electricity in the convent at that time, I suddenly found someone blowing off the flame. Then I found myself surrounded by many colors, red, green, yellow, black, and I heard screams all around me and finally felt something hit my body. I kept repeating, save me, O power of God, protect me, O power of God. Immediately, I felt a power carrying me and putting me in my cell. I told, so I told the darkness, now I know your tricks and how the power of God defeats you. Another time, mother continues, one day early in the morning, I went to work in the kitchen. I filled the stove with kerosene and lit it up. The kerosene tank was next to it. When I tried to make the fire stronger, the flame rose higher. And in a moment, the tank caught fire. I was in a corner and to get out of the kitchen, I had to cross over the fire. The flames grew higher and higher and were about to reach the wooden ceiling. With faith, I cried, help me, O God of Abu Safin, help me, God's martyr, and watch over your convent. Immediately, I saw the martyr before me making the sign of the cross towards the fire, and at once it was extinguished. I was very happy that the convent was saved and thanked God and his martyr. When I told the mother superior about it, she said, the sad one, meaning the darkness, is constantly trying to fight you. All these wars were visible, but later the darkness used other methods. It put in my head the thought that my duties require that I spend the whole day out of my cell. And thus, I do not have enough time to pray, follow my spiritual rules like I used to back at home. It is better that I return to my father's place, the thought echoed in my head. I am coming here to pray, not only to work and serve. I will go back home and live there as a nun. And again, as we've talked about in previous shows, the darkness does this. The darkness can whisper. The darkness can fill your head with all kinds of stuff, but it's up to you whether or not you believe it and whether or not you act or react to it. I resorted to prayer and asked for God's guidance. One night I saw the, saw the martyr, Abu Sifin, who said, what will you do at home after your parents die? A nun who leaves her convent is, excuse me, convent is exactly like a fish taken out of water. Stay and you will be happy amid all this work. Just repeat the Psalms all the time. And if any verse from the Bible consoles you, learn it by heart. I thank God for his love and care. And since then, and whenever I had a free second, I prayed using the Psalms as much time as time permitted. Moreover, I carried the book of hours. Again, that's that book, the Psalms, Akpeya with me all the time. Since that day, I felt I am living in paradise despite all the hard work. The daughter of Christ pursued her way along the royal path, which she sincerely loved, and now she no longer feared the wars of the darkness. Instead, she faced them with courage and alertness, carrying the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word, and arming herself with the breastplate of faith, love, and hope. She lived humbly and showed love towards all the nuns and novices. She served all, putting before her eyes the biblical commandment of love for all and became a living example of humbleness and self-denial. Mother Irene recalls those early days and says, I will share with you some of my experiences when I first joined the convent. One day I was in my cell. One of the older nuns knocked on my door and said, new girl, come and sweep the corridor. I answered, yes, mother. And as soon as I picked up the broom and started sweeping for a few seconds, she said, you, new girl, stop sweeping. I obeyed and said, yes, mother, and at once left to my cell. A few minutes later, the nun returned and knocked hard on my door saying, new girl, come and sweep the corridor. I answered, yes, mother. And as soon as I started to sweep again, she asked me to stop. This happened several times, and each time I replied, yes, mother. Finally, she told me, you were well brought up at home. The convent will not do you any favor. And unfortunately, as we've seen from past shows, um, this is quite the thing 
um, with convents and monasteries is there's a hazing process and you know people are people no matter if they wear a collar or a habit or not and ego pride self you know as i've always said anytime that i me and my gets involved it's it's never it's never good and so here we have you know an older nun hazing uh mother irene and, and trying to break her test her get her to leave resign um and, I, and of course i'm sure this nun felt threatened by mother irene i'm sure she heard a lot about mother irene because you know as we know in small communities especially like a convent or a monastery word travels fast uh about people we saw this with saint faustina remember that folks if you go back to what was it season one there were three episodes of saint faustina a three-parter it's really good if you haven't heard it yet and saint faustina went through very very similar trials and tribulations um, people were constantly at her, testing her. Um, the darkness was constantly at her and testing her, um, even all the way to her death. And also the other nuns, you know, even her mother superior. I mean, it's, it's, it was a mess. It really was a mess, but she persevered. And as we see, this is kind of a, you know, a common line of what happens with saints. And it happens with us in our daily lives. How many times are we tested? And again, we can learn from Mother Irene. We can learn from St. Faustina. We can learn from all of the saints that how what happens to us, we cannot control. But what we can control is how we react and respond. That is ours to do with as we wish. We can fall off at the handle and attack back, which we would consider defending or we can be humble and just move on. Now, I'm not saying that you become a doormat, allowing people to abuse you. Please do not misunderstand me and allow that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is knowing how to choose your battles and when to fight and when not to. The aroma of mother's virtues of humbleness and obedience spread among the nuns and the mother superior recommended her be consecrated as a nun on monday the 26th of october again there's her month 1953 fazia was consecrated as a nun by father makar l Macri, and was given the name of irene she was named after irene the martyr of the fourth century as there was no church at that time in the convent, consecration took place in the church of Abu Sifin that is located next to the convent. How appropriate. It just, you know, absolutely perfect because, you know, St. Abu was the one who was behind everything with her anyway. So that's great. So anyway, there's a little notation here that says to read about the martyr Irene, who Mother Irene was named after, Go to the books section where you will find a detailed PDF about her. So more information for those who want to dive deeper into the martyr Saint Irene. Mother Irene recalls, we spent the whole day before the consecration cleaning the convent. And during the night at church, our time was divided between our individual prayers, and midnight praises. Our confessor spent that night with us to take our confessions. The older nuns and our confessor told each of us, today you are reborn. Note that after penitence and confession, all your sins are forgiven. Thus, you are reborn. During the rite of consecration, we knelt down, our heads touching the ground, and we were covered with a big carpet under which I was surrounded by a pool of tears shed during the funerary rites. I prayed to God and said, God, I do not deserve to be your bride. You've purchased me with your blood and I have done nothing for you. Support me and aid me. Give me the strength and help Let me die towards all the vanities of the world. Make me yours only. I was full of joy, but at the time I prayed tearfully asking God to strengthen me to follow the path that pleases him. It was a beautiful day that I will never forget. 
Oh my, I'm sure. I mean, here she worked all of her life, literally, for that very moment. And for it to come to fruition, man, I'd be right there with her in <laughs> but tears. So yeah, I'd note that uh, to self that when, not if, when, when I receive my holy orders and become a priest, yeah, I'm going to be a mess. You're going to going to need to call Kleenex and have a truck of tissues there. Every nun is given a saint's or martyr's name at the time of consecration. This is giving you some more information. In church history, there could be different saints who carry the same name. In this case, the saint should be specified. Moreover, in one convent, each nun has a unique, excuse me, unique name. Two nuns cannot carry the same name. When a nun dies, a newly consecrated nun may carry her name again. That's interesting that, I mean, I get the whole, no two nuns can have the same name and that's, that's good. But when the one nun dies, her name can live on in another nun. And I wonder if they, this is just me thinking, sorry folks. If I wonder if they tell the nun when they give her the name, that this name is on, not only for this saint, but it's also for this other nun or mother who had the same name. You know, that way you could not aspire to be like that nun, but to always keep them in your heart, in your prayers, and you know, do everything you can to live in, in honor of them and homage of them and be the best that you can be. I guess if you were in that time, I guess it wouldn't matter if they told you or not. You could just assume that the name that they're giving you has probably been used by many, many, many nuns before you. And to do just that, just keep them in your... See here, I'm answering them question. If any of you are out there are of the Orthodox, Byzantine, or Cop Coptic faith and know the answer to that question, I would love to hear from you. Please feel free to contact me and, and please let me know so I can share it with everybody else and my contact information is at the end of the show and at the end of every show. The mother superior chose for me the name of Irene out of her great love for a pious nun who carried his name, or excuse me, carried this name before me and who died before I joined the convent. She told me that this nun worked all day long and prayed fervently all night. Her time was precious. In her last days, God had bestowed upon her the gift of healing the sick. Yet she avoided meeting people and only did so when she was instructed by the mother superior just for the sake of obedience. Well, I guess it answered the question because here her mother superior who, who named her Irene explained the name and the, you know, how it related to the previous person. She has never been out of the gate of the convent since she became a nun. This is referring to the previous Irene, not even for medical attention by night. She used to pass by the cells of the nuns, the old and the young, the ordained and the novices, the sick and the sound, and distributed water she had brought from the well, fulfilling the commandment. Matthew 25, 35, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. She asked God that if he wished to give her the cross of suffering from illness, that she does not fall bedridden and that she could serve herself until the last day and her life and not be a burden to anyone. God granted her wish and revealed to her the day of her departure, three days before it occurred. On that day, she went to the church, received communion, returned to her cell where she rested in peace. After consecration, Irene resumed her struggle and served the nuns, especially the elderly and the sick. She did this with love and humility. Then she was assigned the task of serving the Mother Superior beside her other duties. Mother Irene relates how she spent the early days when she joined the convent and how her guardian angel accompanied her all the time. I worked daily for four, from four in the early morning until 10 or 11 in that evening. I spent all the time between serving the sick and the Mother Superior. And when I returned to my cell, I used to be extremely exhausted. Before I went to sleep, Thoughts crossed my mind. Will I be able to pray? Will I have sufficient time? I used to say, 
Lord Jesus Christ, please bless each hour of my sleep. Make it as if it is ours. Make the four or five hours of sleep as if they are eight. I'm afraid that I might not be able to wake up in time for midnight praise. At that time, there were no alarm clocks or prayer bells in the convent, and each nun woke up on her own. At prayer time, I used to hear a voice calling me three times by my name, Irene. Irene, Irene, wake up. It's time to pray. When I opened my eyes, I used to see an angel over my head, who then moves towards the end of the bed and then turns facing me. And as soon as I sit up, he disappears. Thus, I used to pray joyfully and tirelessly. The angel woke me up daily at the same time and in the same way. And each time I thanked him. One day I asked him, who are you? He answered, I am your guardian angel who accompanies you all the time. And this is something, folks, that Catholics greatly believe in, that each of us are born with a guardian angel. Um, some faiths um, outside of Christianity believe that we have multiple guardian angels that also include uh, loved ones who have passed before us, um, guardians and guides uh, and, and things such as that. So, you know, this is quite real and do i believe it absolutely 100 percent. am i aware of my guardian angel eh, not really i you know i know people who are so tuned in and so awake to realms dimensions and um holy beings um but for me i, I i'm getting there slowly <laughs> there slowly and i don't know what my beef is i don't know if it's because I, of all of what they call in um the eastern ways cliches which is just garbage that i still have in me that i need to clean out you know i need to clean my cellar out and clean my house and uh, i believe the more i do that or the more as i do that the more i will awaken to those things and just like same with you if you're listening and you, you're like me and you've never heard voices or seen visions or anything like that, but I'm sure you've felt things. I mean, we all feel it, whether we're aware of it or not. That's the thing is, again, being aware of it, you know, cleaning our house, our internal, um, what have you, to be able to hear and feel those things. So Mother Irene continues, I really experienced the blessings of hard work in God's house and also the blessings of always lifting up my heart and thankfulness to God. Let me tell you, a, I love, here she goes with the story. I love her stories. This is awesome. Let me tell you a story that shows how God greatly consoles us and gives us more than we ask for when we work joyfully, thankfully, and without complaining. Being the youngest of the nuns, all the work of the convent was on my shoulders. At that time, it was usual for nuns to do a lot of work, even on Sundays. One day, a nun asked me to do some work in the kitchen on a Sunday. I requested to attend mass first, but the nun answered. The early fathers say that work is equal to prayer. I must adapt to this principle in obedience to the nuns, I told myself, and I worked joyfully from all my heart. One day I was promised to attend the first mass next day, provided that I return quickly to perform my duties. I was very happy as it had been three months since I had last attended mass and received communion. I really longed for it. Late this evening, I was informed that I will not be able to do so as there are some tasks I have to do. I obeyed without any complaints and said to myself, I will receive the same blessings of attending mass and thank God. Now this I find quite bizarre because the Catholic faith, those of you who are Catholic know, is very sacramental based. And of all the sacraments, the Holy Eucharist is like the top of the sacraments. So how is it that this nun in a convent is forced to work during mass, but they won't even give her 45 minutes, which is, which is usually what a mass lasts. Um, if you're Orthodox, it's more like two and a half hours, but it's okay. Regardless, why would they not allow her that time 
to attend Mass. She hadn't attended Mass or received the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, in over three months. See, and again, we see this with so many saints. I just don't understand it. I don't understand how her mother superior would allow it. I mean, of course, her mother superior is going to notice that she's not at Mass. You know, maybe not the first or second time, but after three months, she's going to be like, where in the world is Irene? I, I don't I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not them and I can't speak for them, nor would I. And I'm not. I'm not judging because that is a life that I am not familiar with or aware of. It just strikes me as so bizarre and so counter productive and intuitive to do that to somebody. But again, I guess they see it as testing, as trials. Again, as we've seen with all the other saints who've gone through so many trials and tribulations. So Mother Irene continues, that night while praying, I found someone telling me, come and attend mass with the Soa, and I will bring you back just in time for your work. So again, remember what we talked about the Soas before. Remember her mom? heard the was standing at the window at night and heard people having mass in the church and then um irene went next to her and heard it as well and come to find out when talking to the priest it was the soa which are anchorites and ascetics angels and saints who have exalted spirituality and who have been endowed with levitation and movement to distant places they defy time and location, so there's no sense of time, and they can bilocate. Like uh, Father uh, Saint Padre Pio did the same thing. They usually meet together and hold masses in churches at night when they are empty. So Mother Irene asked him, "How will I go?" She's being invited. That tells you the caliber of her holiness. That here this being is inviting her to a soa so she asked how will i go and he said hold on to my gown so this was another worldly being or another uh person who was a soa who was bilocating to her and as soon as i did i found myself rising in the air and in no time i was in a church in the desert with a cross over it. Its entrance was like that of a crypt. And when, or excuse me, and we had to bend down to enter. The church was simply simple, yet very wide and beautiful with an air of high spirituality. I attended mass and received communion after which I was given an Orbana, which is O-R-B-A-N-A, -A, which is an Arabic, Arabic for sacramental bread. So she was given the Eucharist. And it goes on here to say sacramental bread, Latin hostia or hostia, sometimes called altar bread. It's communion bread, the lamb or simply the host. is It is leavened bread, which is used in Christian ritual of the Eucharist in all Eastern Orthodox churches. Now, those of you who are Catholic or Roman Catholic use unleavened bread, right? Bread that has not risen. So you might have the question, if you don't already know, why do the Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox uh, use leavened bread? The reason why is because since it's the body of Christ, they, you know, it's transformed and transfigured into the body of Christ, you know, to, as it's blessed by the priest. They see it as using leavened bread is because Christ has risen. That is a form symbol for them that we are in the time of Christ's resurrection rather than Christ has not risen yet, thus the unleavened bread. I hope that makes some sense. It continues to say the hostia or sacramental bread known as prosphore or prosphoron, which means offering, may be made out of only four ingredients, fine white wheat flour, water, yeast, and salt. Sometimes holy water will be either sprinkled into the dough or on the kneading trough uh, at the beginning of the process, before baking each loaf is stamped with a special liturgical seal, the phosphora should be fresh and not stale or moldy when presented at the altar for use in the divine liturgy. After baking, several phosphora 
are offered to the priest, and he chooses the best one for the lamb or the host that will be consecrated. The remaining loaves are blessed and offered back to the congregation after the end of the divine liturgy, which is the Eucharist. This bread is called the antidoron, which means a or gift returned or in place of gifts. The tradition is that the antidoron is eaten right away without anything beside it. Rest of the baked loaves are distributed to the congregation. Now, again, those of you who are not Orthodox, uh, let me just explain really quickly something about this uh, with the with the Eucharist. Okay, so so the they make these loaves, and then the priest chooses the best one to consecrate. Now the rest of them he blesses. He doesn't consecrate. He blesses, and they take them out to the congregation. Now they believe, the Orthodox believe, in something like a an open table. So say you or I went to an Orthodox service. Now I'm not Orthodox, even though I have Orthodoxy in my heart, and I know a lot of their rituals and their ways, and we're learning more and more as the show goes, right? Um, but we're still, we're not like in Orthodoxy. We're not part of the Orthodox Church. We haven't, you know, joined the Orthodox Church. So when it came time to distribute the Eucharist, we would get, as not being members of the Orthodox Church, we would be offered the blessed bread. So, you know, those who are members of the church and members of Orthodoxy could receive the consecrated bread, but we could receive the blessed bread. And I think that is so awesome that they, you know, it's inclusive. And that although you're not receiving the consecrated bread, you're receiving something. You're receiving the blessed bread that was made with love and blessings by the people who made it there at the church. And to me, that's just very, very beautiful. And I just wanted to share and express that. So Mother Irene asked, where are we? They answered that we are in the church of the Sawa, or Sowa, located on the mountain of St. Anthony near the Red Sea coast. Finally, I found myself back in my cell with the Orbana in my hands. So when she woke up in her cell, or was back in her cell, she had the sacred bread in her hands. Again, proving, you know, giving validity to what she experienced. My heart was full of indescribable consolation and spiritual joy that lasted for a long time. Before I began work, I went to the Mother Superior with the Orbana and told her about all what had happened. She said, you have received the blessings of communion. I take the Orbana. I gave it to her and she divided it and distributed it as a blessing to the nuns. Thus, the nun Irene pursued the life of blind obedience to her mother superior. She tells us of another experience that emphasizes the value of this virtue in God's sight. One day, the mother superior gave permission to all the nuns to attend the Vespers of the Feast of St. Mercurius, the service of the evening prayers preceding the day of the feast. In his ancient church, but she asked me and another nun to attend Vespers at the Virgin's Church, which is next to it. On my way to the Virgin's Church, a thought of quickly lighting a candle in St. Mercurius's church, then go to the Virgin's Church. I heard an inner voice say, St. Mercurius will be cross about it. I wanted to obey my mother superior, so I asked St. Mercurius to guide me to take the right decision. I found that whenever I headed towards the ancient church of St. Mercurius, I was unable to move my legs. And whenever I headed towards the Virgin Church, I was able to move them. Thus, God's will was clear. I said, forgive me, Lord, I will obey blindly. When I returned to the convent, I told the Mother Superior about it. And she said, God and St. Mercurius wanted to show you that obedience is better than offering sacrifices. It is good to be obedient. It was very, I was very happy, and I learned the lesson that obedience is the gem of monastic life, and that God will listen to those who obey. Now, modern day 
This is a very large horse pill for all of us to swallow without choking on it. And that we were like, well, how dare the mother superior deny her to go to, you know, the church of the saint that's pretty much facilitated her being a nun and the reason for her being a nun and being at that church. The one that actually chose her to be a nun in his convent at his church. But there are things that we do not know as we are novices, as we are growing in formation. And this is something I've had to learn as well. And again, sorry, I'm not making this about me, folks, but I, I just want to share in hopes that it can help others is that, you know, I have big issues. Those of you who are know of Aries, I'm an Aries. So I have a very difficult time um, taking direction from someone else. I like to be the one in charge. I like to be the one calling the shots. I like to be the one making the strategy, making the plan, the discipline, carrying it out, following it through, seeing that it's done. And it's very difficult for me, or I should say, not as difficult as it used to be. It used to be very difficult, but it's still somewhat difficult for me to um, obey, to um to submit, to, to surrender, um, you know, I'm getting better at it. And that's thanks to my spiritual director who, <laughs> he does test me and tests me quite often. And it forces me out of that box, out of that comfort zone. And that's what a spiritual director should do. You know, it's not about lollipops, gumdrops and, and sugar candy. It's, it's about you know, your formation about making you into or helping you become what you are aspiring to be, what your calling is for. I mean, formation is huge and it's so overlooked by so many clergy. We have so many priests out there that are ordained priests that have absolutely no formation. They have degrees, they have doctrines, but they lack formation. And that is the foundation of being in clergy, of your holy orders, is you've got to have the solid foundation because anything you put on a weak foundation is just gonna fall. It's gonna crumble, it's gonna fall quick, it's gonna be a, a mess. So Mother Irene continues, from that day onwards, I carried out literally all the orders given to me by my mother superior. East means east, west means west. And when I obeyed, I had clear conscience and my heart was filled with peace. The enemy of all good, darkness, never ceased to take a chance, cause hardships for the nun Irene and waged against her campaign after campaign. She tells us about another form of of his warfare. One day after I was consecrated as a nun, the mother superior asked for me and she was informed that I was resting for a while in my cell. The enemy or darkness ceased this, excuse me, seized this chance to stir up the anger of the deputy nun and the mother superior as well. The mother, mother superior sent for me and said, leave the convent now at once go back to your father's house i begged her to spend the night at the convent and leave the next day after mass but in vain she insisted despite that it was late in the evening and said you are not obedient your obedience is fake she scolded me and after shedding many tears she agreed that i stay for the night i spent the whole night crying and prayed, saying, God, if I had not been consecrated, I could have returned home. How can I go back now? And I found St. Mercurius before me, and he said, Do not be unhappy, and do not leave. This is a war waged against you. I spoke with the Mother Superior. Next day I attended Mass and went to the Mother Superior and said, Forgive me, Mother, I am leaving. I wish that you are always well. Pray for me. She hugged me and kissed me, saying, You are my dear and beloved daughter. St. Mercurius visited me last night. 
and threaten me because of you. Since then, I had a special place in, my, in her heart and was the one who served her all the time and read for her from books, of the lives of saints, and of sayings of early fathers. Later, when my father came to visit, she heartily welcomed him and refused that I go back with him. She kept always encouraging me to endure any troubles caused by the darkness of all what is good. She used to say, don't you want to be a martyr? Isn't this what you are longing for? If you endure hardships and insults and be despised, this, is, this exactly is like martyrdom. So again, we see that when people curse us, chastise us, um, slander us, say negative things about us, it's not coming from a holy place. It's not coming from their divine or true self. It's coming from darkness. It's coming from negativity. It's coming from ignorance, which is poison. Um, but we see a great example from Mother Irene on how to handle this. You know, take our lumps, so to speak. Again, you, you can defend yourself. Just choose your battles wisely. But in this situation, you know, she has taken a rule of obedience, um, a vow of obedience. And, you know, although the mother superior and the head mother were wrong, um, you know, she did the right thing. She, she did what she should do and, and acted and reacted in the right way. You know, she didn't get pissy with them and jump back and get in their face and, you know, tell them they're all full of it and that they're wrong. You know, she, she endured it and it came out for her benefit. Well, folks, <laughs> I hope you all aren't going to be angry with me, but I think we should probably pause here for now. Um, this is already quite long. I was hoping to wrap everything up in this show, but, um, you know, we're still somewhat away from that. Um, so we'll do a part three next week. And we haven't done this since St. Faustina. We've never had a three-parter since her. She was the first and only three-parter. So, I, you know, I, I find it very of, of great blessing and very auspicious that Mother Irene is the second to have a three-parter on our podcast and our show. And I hope you all, I sincerely and deeply pray that you all are enjoying all of this information, all of these stories, and all of these lessons that we're getting through Mother Irene. And I so hope and pray you will come back next week for part three. Well, I will do my level best to wrap this up and put a beautiful Mother Irene bow on it. Okay, so how about this? For closing prayer, why don't we allow Mother Irene to do the closing prayer? Yes, I found a video on YouTube. A link will be in the show notes of Mother Irene uh, leading a prayer and saying a prayer. And just to give you all a heads up, it's four minutes long, a little bit over four minutes long, but and it's in Arabic or Coptic, but it you don't need translation to feel what she is saying. And that's what we've been talking about for so long on the show is going from our heads to our hearts. And this is a great exercise for that. If you, as soon as I, I'll count down, you know, three, two, one, and I'll play it. Uh, close your eyes and relax. If you have headphones, put your headphones on and just listen from your heart to Mother Irene's voice. Okay, so we're going to do the countdown now. Three, two, one. أشكرك يا ربنا يسوع المسيح 
وأنا أسبحك وأنا أمجدك أشكرك يا ربي لأنك جمعتنا في هذا المكان المبارك أشكرك يا رب على محبتك الكبيرة لينا أشكرك يا رب لأنك أنت حنين وطيب أنت قلت يا رب وقولك حق تعالوا إلي جميع المتعبين وصقلي الأحمال وأنا أريح فربي ملناش غيرك وساعدنا علشان نلقي كل أحمالنا وهمومنا عليك وانت اللي تريحنا يا ربي نسألك ونتضرع إليك أن تشفي أمراضنا الروحية والنفسية والجسدية يا ربي فلتكن إرادتك فلتكن مشيئتك لكن يا ربي أسألك من أجل أولادك الواقفين أمام أنك تشفيهم من جميع أمراضهم الجسدية وأنك تبارك فيهم وتحفظهم في اسمك القدوس وترعاهم لأنك أنت هو الراعي الصالح وأنت بذلت نفسك يا ربي جسدك ودمك من أجل رعيتك فيرعاهم يا ربي يسوع المسيح وباركهم يا ربي بكل بركة واجعل بيوتهم عامرة بحسهم يا رب يسوع المسيح وحافظ عليهم وعلى أولادهم اذكر يا ربي كل واحد وواحد باسمه كل واحدة واحدة باسمها الواقفين أمامك فرح قلوبهم وهد سرهم وروق بالهم واعطيهم يا ربي عيشة كلها فرح وسلام معاك حل بسلامك الكامل في قلوبهم وكون يا ربي في وسطهم يا رب يسوع المسيح ساعدنا وقوينا علشان نتمم كل وصاياك لأننا لما نتمم وصاياك هنعيش في سعادة سعادة وهنكمل معاك يا ربي في سعادة كن معنا جميعا وحافظ علينا جميعا وساعدنا وقوينا عشان نتغلب على كل الصعاب اللي تقابلنا في هذه الحياة ويا ربي انت اللي تحل كل المشاكل لأني احنا مين احنا مساكين وضعاف ما نقدرش نعمل حاجة لكن احنا يا رب قوينا عشان نرمي كل حاجة عليك وانت اللي تعمل كل حاجة يا ربي وانت اللي تفرحنا وفرحنا بيك وفرح يا رب الواقفين امامك باولادهم وكن معاهم وحل بسلامك الكامل في بيوتهم وفي قلوبهم وفي وسطهم وفي شغلهم بصلوات وشفاعات القديسة الطاهرة مريم وجميع الشهداء والقدسين وجعلنا مستحقين أن نقول بشكر يا أبانا الذي كذلك على الأرض Amen. Before we begin this week's prayer requests and updates, I want to thank each and every one of you who are listening to this right now. I, I don't understand for the life of me, but there are so many people that skip over this part. And yeah, I, I can tell there's all kinds of tools uh, on Anchor that can show you who listens to what and where and all this, that, and the other as far as numbers go. And for whatever reason, a lot of people skip uh, this section, the prayers and updates. And again, for the life of me, I don't understand. I know it's long, but these are people who are in need of our prayers. And if you're listening to the show, isn't prayer part of your life? I mean, isn't that part of your faith? Um, anyway, so again, infinite thanks, blessings, and love to all of you for not only listening to the prayer requests and updates each week, but 
for adding these blessed souls to your prayers. So we begin with a couple new uh, people. Haley um, has ovarian cancer. She's had it for over six years now. And as of December of this past year, the doctors found that they have no further treatment for her. So she's slowly in the process of passing from this life. Um, she has not given up. She's still fighting. And, you know, I want us all to please pray for not only Haley, but her husband, Taylor, and for her four-year-old son, Weston. Haley is spending as much time with them and her family as she possibly can in making the most of every moment, even the bad days. And, you know, I firmly believe in miracles. And, you know, let us pray that Haley is healed from head to toe. Um, she is a very young woman. She's probably in her mid to late 20s at the most. Um, so, and she has not only her whole life ahead of her, but her life with her husband and life with her child. Uh, so let us please, please, please pray for Haley, Taylor, and Weston. Next is Maudie, M-A-U-D-I-E. Maudie uh, was, had heart failure uh, so bad that she had to have a heart transplant. And Maudie had that done almost a week ago. Uh, well, a little bit over a week ago. And I'm very happy to report that uh, her body has not rejected the heart that was donated to her and, and installed, I guess you could say. Um, she's doing good. Her spirits are great. She's feeling great. However, uh, since the heart, uh, the new heart, she has picked up 30 pounds of water weight. Now, you know, that is a sign of heart failure. Even though her heart is doing good, that's not good. Um, so, you know, I know that because that's how I found out I had heart failure was I had exactly 30 pounds of water weight gain um, and bloating. But she's, she's in the hospital still. She hasn't been released. She was hoping to get to come home this weekend, but, you know, that hasn't worked out. So let us please, please, please pray for Maudie that she 100% heals and recovers and that she is able to leave the hospital sometime this week and go home and resume her life. Now, both Haley and Maudie are on TikTok. I'll see if I can include links to them on uh, in the show notes. Uh, for those of you who want to check them out and support them, I highly recommend it, and thank you all for praying for them. Um, Elaine is in need of prayers. Um, her and Bob were celebrating his uh, recent oncology appointment, which I'll get to here in a moment. Um, and while they were at the restaurant, um, Elaine's blood pressure dropped very low and she fainted. She was taken to the emergency room and they found that she was dehydrated. Um, so let us pray for Elaine that she continues to recover. She's doing good now, but um, let us please, please, please pray for her. I believe she said she goes to her cardiologist on the 9th of March, so that's still a little bit away. So let us keep her in our prayers. Next is her husband, Bob. Uh, Bob went to his oncologist this week to review his CT scan uh, and his um, one of his lymph nodes that had the cancer has shrunk way down. So Bob now only has to go for treatment, or excuse me, for a checkup every six months and then a CT scan every year. And he has to do that for the next two years. So let us please keep Bob in our hearts, thoughts, and prayers. They've been working, folks. You know, prayers are powerful, beyond powerful. There's no words that describe the power of prayer um, and miracles that come from that. So infinite thanks, blessings, and love to all of you for continued prayers for Bob. Next, we have general uh, prayers for health and well-being for Haven, Lana, Megan, Molly, Gwen, Octavia, Clyde, Mike S, Kathy, K, 
Kathy's husband, Tony, who was just diagnosed with COVID this past week, he's recovering, so let us pray for him. Michael T., Father Mike is in need of our prayers. He is having some really serious health condition issues lately. He is stable, he's home, uh, but doctors are still baffled after what, over six months, they can't figure out what's wrong with him. Also, please keep his husband, Eddie, in your prayers. Emma, Jean, my sister, Tanya, her husband, Ron, got the job. Thank you all for your prayers for that. Let us please keep them in our heart, thoughts, and prayers that everything continues to go well for them. Cheryl, uh, Elijah is still uh, working hard to get a job. He had some prospects and now he's waiting for callbacks and interviews and all that. And he is getting quite stressed, which we could all understand and depressed. So let us please keep Elijah and his husband, Andrew, in our heart, thoughts, and prayers. And finally, last but certainly not least is Reverend Donald Lewis, who suffered a massive heart attack um, over a week ago. From last I heard, he was stable, but in critical condition. I know his uh, parishioners in his church are praying healing prayers for him fervently. Let us please join them in prayers that uh, Reverend Lewis is completely healed and able to return to his parish and his followers. I so hope and pray that you've enjoyed the show and that you found everything that you're searching for here and more with us. Please feel free to stop by anytime, all the time. You are family. If this show has helped you, please, please, please share it with as many people as possible. Also, subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever format you listen to. That helps move the show up in those formats so when someone does a general search, they're more likely to find the show. And if the show has really helped you and you have the means, please consider making an offering. Offerings are a great way to help sustain and improve the show as well as the Faith and More ministry. Offerings can be made through the Cash App. The show's cash tag is dollar sign faith and more, or you can find us at cash.app forward slash dollar sign faith and more. And don't forget about our YouTube channel. It's a fun place, folks. You can watch videos of weekly Ask Angel questions where people write me and ask me questions and I respond uh, on YouTube. You can also watch me do bi-weekly sermons and homilies. Also, audio of our shows are uploaded to YouTube where you can listen and much, much more. Just go to youtube.com forward slash at faith and more podcast. Next is prayers. I love to pray and our faith and more family love to pray. So let us pray for you. There are two ways to do this. The first is to email me directly at faithandmorepodcast at gmail.com. The second way is through our website. There is a form at the bottom of the website, and the website address is faithandmorepodcast.wixsite.com forward slash my dash site. And there are always links to all of these in the show notes for and description for each show. So until next time, have a blessed week and know that each and every one of you are in my heart and in my prayers. Bless you.